bit of our AGM, which is the presentation from our four speakers. Um, I'd first like to say that, well, welcome to anyone that has just joined us. And we're now moving on to our segment on the environmental and socio-economic benefits of the 20-minute neighbourhood concept and what that looks like in practice in rural Scotland. And I would just like to ask you, please, if you have any questions, we'll take them at the end. And um, if everyone could mute and you can put your question on chat, or um, if you have a question you want to ask, just type in that you want to ask a question. I'm sure for those of you who do this quite a lot, that will seem quite clear, at least I hope it does. Our first speaker is Stephanie O'Gorman, Director of Sustainable Economics, Ramball, UK, an introduction to the 20 minute neighbourhood concept. Um, Stephanie, I hope you're with us. I am, I am, I'm here. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> um, do you just want to start? And yeah, um, so the slides have gone again. Um, do you want me to share? Or if you can, that would yeah, be good. that's absolutely fine. I wasn't entirely sure um, if I was. Do, 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 do. Where's the share button going on? I don't use Zoom very often. Apologies. It's usually down. Well, it's down. Share it and it's in bright screen. green. It's the biggest okay. button on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Let me just do that. So hopefully, hopefully now you can see see my slides. Um, so, uh, yeah, so um, as you said, Stephanie O'Gorman, so I'm a director of economics in, in Ramble. Um, some of you, I imagine, won't know who Ramble are, so I thought I'd just do a, a brief introduction. Uh, so we're um, a, a sustainable society consultant, which I find very difficult to say in my Irish accent without tripping myself up. Um, but you know, in essence, historically an engineering and architectural firm, um, but actually providing consultancy across a whole range of different um, professional services. We are Nordic, um, we have a Nordic heritage and we're owned by, um, we're a foundation company. So actually um, our foundation's mission is to sustain the business and to, to deliver um, places and uh, that, that help nature and, and people flourish. So it's really a sustainability agenda that underlines our business ethos. Um, and so I'm based in the Edinburgh office um, and we have, we have 50 odd consultants in Edinburgh doing lots of different things and across Scotland. Um, so the 20 minute neighbourhood concept, you, you know, I, I'm not hugely aware of how familiar people are with it. So apologies if if some of this isn't um, news to you, but the Scottish government's definition of, of this is where people can meet their needs within a 20 minute walk from their houses, enabling people to live better, healthier lives and supporting our net zero ambitions. So lots of what you've just shown on your video, really, you know, lots of that is, it sits really under, under this definition. And the work we did for Scottish government, um, so, it was, so it was, uh, the, towards the end of last year and into this year. So I think we published in March um, and we've seen a huge amount of progress since then. So really the, the um, underlying need for the research was um, linked to the climate change plan, linked to the development of the programme for government, um, but also things like the Town Centre Action Plan and the place principle and place standard and how, how that was developing and how, how we could um, seek to integrate and support that. But it was very much the first step in this process. So um, it was a small piece of work and one which we would have loved to have done more on. But actually, I think what it's done is it's catalyzed a huge amount more work in the last six months. So I can touch on that, any of that in questions if needs be. Um, so it became clear that um, in the discussion, there are three core elements to the delivery of a 20 minute neighborhood. And the features and infrastructure are one element. So, you know, are the services there? Are the things that people need and want in the community accessible? But, you know, that's kind of the easy bit. Um, <laughs> the, we need those services and, and that infrastructure to be of a certain quality. And we need the experiences to be of a certain 
level in order to encourage people to use and, and behave in that way. And, and that's a really critical element to, to this. Um, but in addition, you know, you can have both of those things, but you still need people to, to get out and do this and to walk and use their services locally and get on their bike and, and interact in a different way in their community. Um, and so that engagement and, and behaviour change is a critical element to actually moving from having the potential of a 20 minute neighbourhood to being a place that performs as a 20 minute neighbourhood. So people's behaviours um, are, are as such. So the work we've done um, and the, the, uh, all of the premise of our work is sits um, on top of the place standard. You know, it, it is it totally aligns with the place standard. I'm not um, sure if if you are all aware of this tool um, or have used it, um, but it's a really valuable engagement tool. And my understanding now is actually that it's being rolled out across Europe um, and uh, and used in lots of different contexts. So that's you know really fantastic leadership from a Scottish Scottish perspective. And it's used to um, facilitate discussions. So what you get out of this tool is the perception of the local community. And what I believe the 20 minute neighborhood and, and our approach and our data approach to this could do is then overlay on this a, an infrastructure and service provision element. So you, you start to identify and understand where the gaps and perceptions and reality are and needs and, and wants are. So lots of opportunity in the development. Um, so our, our definition is here um, in terms of what, what the elements or the features of a 20 minute neighbourhood are. And you'll have probably seen the version that, that uh, Melbourne used, but this, this version is a specific Scotland one and it, and it aligns with that 20 minute, uh, with that place standard. So we talk about movement, we talk about resources, which are maybe the two obvious things that when people think about 20 minute neighbourhoods, they think of. But we also need to think about the spaces recreation, the quality and the, the provision of natural space, and also that civic elements in terms of identity and belonging and feelings of safety and stewardship. So, you know, how much influence people have and the control they feel they have in their local environment. And from a benefits perspective, you know, the core benefits to this concept are um, clearly, you know, uh, addressing climate action to some degree, getting people out of cars and into using active travel more where that's possible. Um, but it's also about improved livability and quality of life. It's about decreasing health inequalities and it's um, clearly also about improving local economy. So the work we went through, we, we did a number of things, but we baselined the whole of Scotland um, in, in terms of that definition. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to read this graphic in the middle, um, but it is in the report. And, and what, what this shows is we've taken all the features and we've mapped them into data streams. So actual data indicators, and that's indicators of um, quantity. So is, is this present or not? But it's also indicators of quality. So where we could find quality indicators, we also allocate those. Now, in many cases, we haven't, because we did this at a national level, um, we've used national, um, so deprivation information and, and other things that is available nationally to support that. But you could uh, absolutely improve this data set by applying local uh, quality data, which will exist in many cases. It was just that we didn't have the possibility of going down that route. And so what we have, and again on the website, these maps are available. Um, uh, this is a, a relative ranking from the best in terms of that uh, availability of infrastructure and quality uh, or services to to the least best performing. Um, so they are they are relative. It's a relative indices of what you get. And the other thing we did was we looked across the globe at what other people are doing. Now, people may be aware of Melbourne um, and Portland and Oregon, and um, you know they, they are places that have moved quite dramatically forward on this agenda. Um, but really what we found was uh, nobody's talking about this at a national level. Um, there isn't certainly much public discussion about this as a rural or a semi-rural discussion. Um, and um, the other thing is that public participation comes out as absolutely critical to the success of this as an approach. So every place is different in terms of what it wants and needs. So there isn't a one size fits all. 
And interestingly, the place principle, you know, the, the Australians in Melbourne are now applying the place principle, having taken that from Scotland um, and, and really recognising the value of that. And some of the kind of specific measures we came across, which I quite liked, um, I thought it was worth flagging are, so in Melbourne, they talk about uh, neighbourhood activity centres, and that's about bringing density and everything together. So bringing those services together into one place and adding that density, which pulls people in, um, which is really, uh, really valuable. But other things like dual shop fronts, and I think from a rural perspective, this is, um, or a, a a rural community perspective is really valuable that you know, you're activating a shop front by having a shop there and people come and go but really that's maybe not sustainable in terms of the 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 uh, number of customers you have access to so you add a, an online uh, service as well so you you get the benefits of of extending that customer base but actually activating the local community so things like that i thought were really um interesting so we then, um, sorry, there we go, um, identified a number of ambitions for Scotland. And we believe that there's absolutely the opportunity for Scotland to be a global leader in this. And, and that is really focusing on, on a national approach to this that is both urban and rural. Um, you may or may not have been um, you know, involved in conversations where people have the perception that this is a, an urban opportunity maybe is what you would call it and our work absolutely found that that is not the case there are lots of rural communities that that really um are already in a position in quite a good position and with some support or with some engagement or with some additional services could really um perform like this um in, with not too much effort um We've also set out an ambition that every neighbourhood in Scotland should be facilitated to be a 20 minute neighbourhood and communities should be empowered um, to make the changes that they need to do that. Um, we should, uh, this concept enables people also to travel um, actively in support of their health and well-being and um, without access being limited to cost of transport and and I'm fully aware of the the issues in rural Scotland around transport poverty and the high cost of transport from a, a proportion of people's wages so really supporting that and and using this concept as a, an opportunity to to address that to some some extent um, definitely has potential. And, and also the 20 minute neighborhood is about really pulling everything else together. It is an umbrella, uh, I wouldn't say a policy, I'd say a concept that, that allows all of those policy elements to be, to be drawn in and to deliver for a place in a coherent way. So we have um, two sets of recommendations um, coming out of this. The first being more strategic and in, in nature. And I think it's about taking the, the fourth um, national planning framework and really ensuring that 20 minute neighborhoods is embedded in that. And, and the program for government has outlined that now. And the little graphic here is about, you know, rethinking how, how we zone and plan and, you know, what, what 20 minute neighborhoods need is density um, and, vertical zoning may be a way, you know, an interesting concept to, to think about in, in, in delivering that. Um, there needs to be a greater emphasis on reducing private car journeys and, and you know, fully aware that uh, Scotland is committed to a 20% vehicle kilometre reduction plan. Um, and how does this, how can we use this concept to support that? And, and I'm hopeful that when the route map for that comes out at the end of the year, the 20 minute neighbourhoods will be a, a key part. Um, and then it's about defining the concept and the framework and the funding at a national level, but actually supporting local communities to develop that ambition and delivery and participation. So it's a very much a, you know, what we've recommended is a, is a top down and bottom up approach to doing this because the communities won't be able to do it if they don't have that framework. And then from a kind of a practical perspective, demonstrator projects are really important and these have started now and we're seeing more of this in the last six months since we published our report. Um, the, the premise of a 20 minute neighbourhood is, is based on an 800 metre walking distance. Now that is a kind of an industry standard across the world. We, nobody knows whether people are prepared to walk that in Scotland, <laughs> you know, or what that visual perception needs to be, the quality of environments needs to be to, to get the behavioural change. So 
we were we were proposing that actually some work is done to really understand where the bounds of um, people's uh, willingness are in this um, from a walking and cycling um, uh, prospect are. And then we talked about mapping more on the baseline and doing some more work on that and, and really thinking about how the place principle is working in local authorities and, and how whether there are any existing barriers or, or other things that can be done to overcome um, and improve the application of that at a local level because I think that sits as a core uh, delivery driver for this. So that's me, um, a very quick whistle stop tour through this report. The report is available online, just Google 20 minute neighbourhoods and, and you'll get it. You'll either get our Ramble site or directly to the Climate Exchange. And I'm very happy to pick up questions at the end. Um, I will stay online and um, uh, yeah, or, or just drop me a note. A note. Thank you. Thank you much, very much, Stephanie. That um, was interesting, food for thought. And um, maybe for some of us who don't know public transport or cycle tracks, um, uh, maybe it's somewhere we have to, what we have to think about in the future. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and we've and lots of discussions about this. Yeah, um, yeah but there's certainly a lot there to think about. Um, so, Ronnie, you were going to say a bit about our approach to the 20 minute neighbourhood. Thanks, Sheena. Yeah, I'll just share my screen if that's all right. Can you all see the screen now? Is that okay? No, I'm not seeing anything at the moment. It's oh, yeah, just got it now. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks everyone for, for Sheena and for everyone coming along. Uh, thanks to Stephanie, that was that was great. Um, it's great to see all the, the synergies with our work. Um, Sorry, Ronnie, can I just say, could you start the slideshow? Sorry, we can see your screen, but it's not sort of the full screen slideshow you just yet. Okay, I've got something. Something's not right here then. What do I need to do to share the full screen? I thought so it was. Yeah, just click the slideshow button at the bottom or in the top menu. It, it was showing on my screen. Do I need to reverse screens or something like that? Uh, yeah, just click that and we'll see in a second. It's taking a wee while this morning. <laughs> Sorry about this, folks. I blame the windy weather. <laughs> the internet just goes haywire. <laughs> Is that it working at all now? No, maybe, yeah, maybe try in the slideshow in the top menu and then and begin slideshow from, from the beginning. Try that instead. Do we need to reverse screen or something like that? No, no we're, not, we're not saying that at all even. Um, we're literally okay. just saying sort of the working aspect of it. So yeah, slideshow from beginning and then we'll see. It might also just work to stop sharing and reshare. Okay. You could try that. Okay, I'll try that. Do we have any luck here, no? Um, can't see anything. Should I just share from from? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, no Sorry worries. About that, folks. That's always one second. Anyone who knows me knows I'm afraid that IT is not my strong point. Is that us now? That's great. That's, that's a full screen now. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, sorry about that, that blip, folks. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, thanks to Stephanie, it's, it's great to see some of the, the, the synergies there, uh, especially with a lot of the work that's gone on uh, since what used to be HSCHT, now CHT, um, started over 20 years ago. Um, a little bit about what we do. 
um, we're very much focused on, on supporting communities. Uh, we've got a focus on delivery and finding solutions. Um, in our name, I think communities is the important word and it's about taking a holistic approach uh, to the needs of communities uh, and, and that's to achieving placemaking uh, principles, uh, which is underpinned in the 20 minute neighbourhood principle. And that's a principle, like I say, uh, I think we've been using since inception over 20 years ago. So we're, we're delighted to see this now featuring in the likes of uh, housing to 2040, etc. When we're looking at communities and, and speaking to communities, it's about all elements of, of that. So it's about housing, it's about essential infrastructure like schools, the economy, and the social elements like so sports and health. Uh, to enable that, you know, underpinning it again is, is housing options, and we need the widest range possible. Um, that's about a providing choice and which in turn in our opinion uh, enables confidence um, so we've been busy developing a wide range of different options and housing options and and, make, and getting them delivered on the ground and that, that's used at, at a range of, of partners um, all of that is underpinned by strong policy uh, we're delighted to have seen all the, all the positive policy developments over the last few years from Scottish Government and we feel that uh, stronger communities has been enabled like never before and I'm delighted to see uh, Stephanie mentioning that uh, you know Scotland's leading the way. That's certainly our perception when we're talking to our neighbours in the UK. Uh, there, there, there's jealous eyes looking over the border uh, at, at what's going on here. Um, and, you know, that's underpinned by funding two things like so the Rural Housing Fund, Scottish Land Fund and all other financial mechanisms that have been developed, things like the self bill Loan Fund, etc. So, um, yeah, so we, where, are, where are we delivering these things? Well, between working closely with our friends at South of Scotland Community Housing, we're able to offer services across the whole of Scotland. Um, and uh, it's not just rural, like Stephanie was saying, the principles of the 20 minute neighbourhood apply all over and you're going to see some examples of that. And Janet's probably going to talk about the impact um, of that in the likes of Gearloch. We've, um, we've developed a very uh, a broad brush um, slide here that shows you all, all the work that's been delivered over the years, over the many years uh, that, that, that we've been working with communities. And that very much, um, as Stephanie was saying, there's no one size fits all. It's important that, uh, you know, if we're going to create our, our Brigadoon, if you like, um, you know, we, communities play the active part in deciding what they want, whether it's a school or um, tourist hub or uh, training facilities. Um, it, it, these things are possible and these things have been delivered. So it, it, it's real examples. It's about place making. It's about um, delivering as far as possible uh, the, the, the 20 minute neighbourhood principle because like I say um, communities do want and need that uh, uh, and the uptake and interest from communities is huge now. Okay. Uh, Strontian is, is one of the examples that we worked through. We've been working there for a number of years now and a, a very proactive community there. Um, one of the first local place plans that we've done um, that was a number of years ago and that's been adopted by uh, by the Highland Council. Um, it's Again, it's great to see policy now supporting this widely through National Planning Framework 4. Uh, community place plan is, is up front and centre there and that's great to see and we expect a lot more of that to be going ahead. Um, the benefits of that work in the likes of Strontian are, are, are clear to see. The early work uh, has meant that, you know, there's, there, there's schools being provided, there's different housing tenures being provided, 
uh, and there's more work ongoing in, in Strunty and they're, they're looking at a, a range of other projects, um, elderly housing, care, um, a lot of other good work still going on and it's all based on, on the early uh, forward looking planning that they had. Just to to show what else is possible. I mean, it's not just about greenfield sites. It's not necessarily just about uh, new builds. It's about renovations. It's about regeneration. It's about derelict sites. Tom and Towle are doing a fantastic project at the moment. It's on site. It's in the centre of Tom and Towle, and it's it's on a derelict site. Um, providing a range of housing, including live work, which is hugely um, popular at the moment. Um, it, it, it again fits really well with um, the 20 minute uh, neighbourhood principle. And dealing with uh, derelict sites or houses, it, we feel is extremely important because it, it lifts the feel of communities and, and it, again, it increases the confidence within communities. We've got some some long established uh, projects, likes of of our Gale, which was really about keeping the school open. And again, it, it it's not necessarily about building a new school; it's about keeping your existing services there. Um, it's about training and skills development. Um, the environment was hugely important there. It was hugely important there, as it is in in in, in all projects. Uh, and, and it's leading on to things like the Forest Crofts, which is becoming, again, a self-sustaining model that, that we're working on in a number of areas. Yeah, um, I mean, staff, and again, is another great example. Um, it, it's just, just about to be completed, and that's where the community have developed, you know, mixed use. So there's a health centre, commercial stuff, uh, a range of housing, uh, and it's working to enable support from other partners and, and enabling the partners to provide better services, likes of the NHS. I think uh, it's, it's going to improve healthcare in, in the area hugely. Uh, and it's enabled the likes of Ohio Sky Housing Association to, to build houses where they would ordinarily maybe struggle with, with viability there. Um, and it's, it, it's creating jobs, you know, local development officers being able to work there. Ronnie, yeah. we're, we're running a wee bit behind time. Can you... Sorry, yeah, I'll just, just finish off very quickly. Um, Apple Cross, we're delighted to be working there. It's, it's long awaited, um, but again, a place planning principle is, is looking great um, and it's already looking forward to new projects happening. Uh, elderly mixed developments all in the pipeline and uh, we're, we're going to hear just now from Janet about the Gearlock project so I won't need to say too much about that but again a, a great example of, of mixed use mixed housing and all providing different elements that uh, support the 20 minute community um, I'll, I'll wind up now um, and uh, we've got lots of other projects ongoing at the moment that we're, we're excited to, to be taking forward, but uh, we look forward to working hopefully with, with some of you in the future. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And um, Janet, are you going to tell us a bit about, we visited Gearloch last year and um, we're much impressed, quite jealous, so I would like to hear a lot more about it um, from the Lafew Action Forum. Thank you very much. Yes, I will attempt to share my screen too. I'm, I'm a bit like Ronnie and not that technically um, adept. Bizarre, like Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. So are we good? Can we see this? Yes. Yes. First thank hurdle you. overcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me along. Um, I'm Janet Miles and um, I'm the Managing Director of Gearlock and Lockheed Action Forum, which uh, is known really as Gale locally and it's much less of a mouthful. Um, 
We're a development trust and we serve the communities of Gerlach and Hugh, which is really the middle part of Westeros. And like every development trust across the country, of which there are about 300 now, um, our remit is to make our area a better place to live and work. And we do this through a range of community-led and owned projects. We touched on a lot of the issues that we, we look at um, through various um, presentations we've had so far, but the issues we focus on are trying to strengthen our economy um, through sustainable economic development. And we do that, we, we're quite keen on community wealth building at the minute. Um, try to create more services in our community, local. Um, again, that resonates with the 20 minute neighborhood. Um, and we're also trying to tackle seasonality. We're a tourist area and have a hugely seasonal economy. Um, services are seasonal and jobs are seasonal. So we're trying to work on that as well as looking at um, social inclusion, trying to involve more people who are um, disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, in our community. We do this across the whole of the Gerlach and Lockie area, which in itself is by no means a 20 minute neighbourhood, I'm afraid. It's an hour and a half's drive from one side of our patch to the next. So it's quite a big area, but within that, we've got lots of um, smaller communities. Um, and back in the late nineties, we started out um, as an organisation. One of our very first projects was to create some affordable housing um, in Inverasdale, which is a fairly rural part of our patch. And we, we built four houses near to the primary school that were all within a, a walking distance. So that was the beginnings of a 20 minute neighbourhood, I would say. And fun Janet, fact, um, Janet, fun, can I, sorry? Do you, are you actually showing a, a slideshow at the moment? I'm just about to, but um, oh, right. can you so see? Still, can you, we've still got the front cover. Uh, yeah, know, I'm the, just about. Oh, that's fine. I just wondered if there was a technical issue. Sorry to interrupt. I'll try and wind up my introduction quicker. No, 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 that's fine. I'm not <laughs> rushing you. I just wondered if, if you're missing something, but that's fine. Sorry. Yeah, well, I was just going to finish off that little section by saying a fun fact was that um, we got to know the Highland Small Communities Housing Trust um, back in the late 90s when they first started out, really. And we were their very first community member. So I <laughs> thought that was a nice fact to put in. <laughs> so I'm going to start um, looking, just zooming in on Gearlock, really. So this is my first slide, Audrey. <laughs> um, and our folks, so we do cover a big area, but um, this project is focusing on Gearlock, which is quite a scattered community. Um, it's based around the, the loch, and um, I've put a wee map up in the top corner there. Um, and we've got the start. Uh, can you see my mouse as well? If I'm pointing. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, the, so this area of, of Gearlock is called Straff and it has these, these set kind of shops like a main sort of street. And then we've got another area down this end um, called, which is the harbour, and it's got a lot of sort of shop services, um, tourist services really. Uh, and then the central part of Gearlock was always quite um, removed from the other, it didn't really connect. It has the school and um, the, the medical centre and sort of public sector kind of facilities. Quite a lot of the site was, um, the, that area was um, sort of empty or, or there was a big derelict site. Um, so the community was kind of disconnected and it, this this is part of Achter Cairn, which is the site that we ended up building on with the, the Community Housing Trust. And um, Ronnie shared some lovely pictures of what it looks like today. Um, I just have this really old photograph, which at the time I didn't realise how relevant it would be. I wished I'd um, got a better photograph, but anyway, um, a hotel burnt down on this site in 1999, and um, it really is a derelict bit of the village. Um, our vision was to create more of a, a physical centre to the village here, um, to create a social and economic heart for the village uh, using, using this site. Um, and the road in front that you see, um, we used to think that was called the A832. Uh, nowadays, that is called the North Coast 500. <laughs> but at the time, we had not heard of that. Yeah. Um, so the idea was to create affordable housing in, and a mixed housing tenure, really, in, in the back of the site. And then at the front, some community and retail use. Um, and in effect, we really created two 20 minute neighbourhoods because 10 minutes in one direction walk, you get to the harbour and the services there, and 10 minutes in the other direction, you get up to staff and the um, shops and cafes 
um, of a village there, as well as the um, school and medical centre. So today, um, this is what the site looks like. Um, I've been very biased and I'm focusing on the Gale Centre because that is what we've, <laughs> that's our part of the site. But um, you can see um, a glimpse of the houses around the back there that the Housing Trust um, organised. It took us a very long time to make this happen. It was uh, nine years in the planning and we, I mean, the Housing Trust were very, very patient with us. They, land banked a lot of the ground around and waited for us to be able to um, put our plans together as a community. Um, when you see the building, uh, it, we've taken into account environmental issues when we built it. Uh, we're very keen that it was a low impact building. It's a um, certified passive house, which means that it, it's super insulated, it's airtight sealed, and um, it's made, uh, it's, it's got passive energy, so we get heat from the sun through those windows at the front. We've got a living roof on the on the top there to try and um, infiltrate rainwater and also um, absorb carbon dioxide. The building itself is made out of untreated timbers and these lovely posts that you see, the vertical posts going up, up the building, they carry on throughout the building and they are made of Douglas fir, which is grown in Scotland. And the cladding is all Scottish grown larch as well. So we've got quite good environmental credentials just in the building of, of the, of the centre. Inside, uh, we use it for lots of different reason, purposes. We've got our community cafe. We have local people provide cakes for the cafe. We've got 20 bakers at the minute. Uh, they bake cakes at home and we sell them for them in the cafe. Um, we have bakers aged 8 to 80 at the minute and they use the money for pocket money, augmenting pensions, and some people use it to pay the bills and, and um, keep their heads above water, really. Uh, each year we pay out um, roughly £25,000 to bakers for their, for their cakes, so it's a, a reasonable contribution to our local economy. We also provide empl um, employment, but also volunteering opportunities, and we provide um, activities for people who are disadvantaged in our community, maybe they've got disability, um, and we provide this supportive volunteering uh, activities. We also run um, community get-togethers, like social meals, like this one that you see um, in the picture in the middle there. Um, and one of our things is that we are always open, so we're really trying to tackle seasonality. And if you exclude the awful COVID year, 18 months, um, we have been open pretty much every day since the centre was built. Um, we have our 365 day policy. We try to open every single day of the year and we do provide, um, a, if we can, a Christmas meal as well for people who are maybe on their own in the community. We also have a retail space in the centre, um, which we provide um, space for people to exhibit their art and craft work, or, and we also have a permanent exhibition space. Um, within the centre, we uh, have roughly 50 um, artists, craft workers, producers who sell their products, so it might be books, maps and guides of the local area that have been made and produced and written locally. Um, jams and preserves or, or artwork or um, this knitwear that you see um, in the picture. So it's quite a range of stuff, but we've got, um, so we've got 40, 40 of those sort of local people and um, we generate about £50,000 worth of income for them through the sale of their products in, in a sort of average year. We also run a tourist information centre from the building. Um, it's a year-round service. We have a fully staffed information service providing free information and advice to uh, visitors, help trying to help them get the best out of their stay in our area, encouraging them to slow down a bit and stay longer, maybe visit some of the places off that main road and then NC500 and, and go off the beaten track a little bit more um, and really try and maximise the community benefit of, um, of tourism to our area. We serve about 35,000 visitors a year through this centre, um, so it's, it's quite busy and it's, it's fairly seasonal still. Then outside we um, grow our own produce where we can to sell, sell in the cafe, to salads and vegetables and herbs. We also have edible flowers and cut flowers for the tables. 
We use the outdoor space to provide volunteering opportunities and teach people about outdoor learning activities and skills. Um, we also try to minimise our waste by composting virtually everything that we can uh, from kitchen uh, produce, vegetable peelings, things like that, coffee grounds and um, paper and cardboard. Uh, and uh, we do quite like messing around in the compost heap, as you can see there in that top picture. Um, but it's, it really does help reduce our waste. We also use the compost to mulch the beds, it keeps the slugs and snails away. Uh, we produce an awful lot of um, coffee grounds and uh, these are really, really useful in the, in the garden. And I'm very, very proud of myself this year. I grew some mushrooms in the coffee grounds, which we're going to try and increase our, increase our production for future years. But that, those are spent coffee grounds and oyster mushrooms growing growing in them, uh, which not quite enough to make a bowl of soup yet, but um, it's a work in progress. So after um, 10 years of uh, establishing the Gale Centre and getting it up and running, I believe that we have achieved the social and economic hub that we really dreamed of right at the start um, of our, that was our vision for the place. And um, the centre supports 20 year round jobs uh, we've got 30 volunteer placements, including um, those with disadvantages. Um, we generate a roughly £250,000 a year, which 75% um, of that is then spent directly back into the local Gear Lock and Lock U community. Um, we're very keen on the community wealth building, as I mentioned before, and about 5% of our population receive a direct payment from Gale every year whether that's from supplying product to the shop or services or um, through direct employment. Uh, and I haven't been paid to say this, but I would definitely say it would not have been possible without the Housing Trust. Um, the fact that they were able to land bank and keep that land for us while we got our act together as a community it made all the difference. Um, and yeah, I finally just like to welcome everybody to come and visit us in Girl because the pictures don't really do it justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet, and we will come at the first opportunity. <laughs> Looking forward to coffee and homemade cakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, Hamish, are you around? Yes. Hello. Hi, Gina. Well, hi, Hamish. Right. So you're going to give us a bit of a rundown of your duties as the, in the Scottish Land Commission, or is it specifically on something else? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll just um, I'll pick up the themes of um, what we've been talking about today and just uh, just share some thoughts from there, if, if I can. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not brave enough to use slides, so I'm just going to speak for 10 minutes or so. Um, and uh, thanks, Janet. I have indeed enjoyed coffee and cake several times in the, uh, the Gerloff Cafe there. I uh, can, highly, can highly recommend it. <laughs> um, so we've heard um, a bit just now, obviously, about the 20-minute neighbourhood concept. Um, and about some of the examples of places that you've helped communities deliver. And, and I do think it's great to be reminded of the power of this work um, and the experience that you collectively have in delivering these kind of places. Um, I think it's not surprising that the concepts of what we now call 20-minute neighbourhoods and the circular economy are absolutely built into the approach of community-led housing. Um, that, of course, is the strength of your approach. Um, as Shina said earlier, you build much more than houses. And I think that's really our thinking about the role of land, too. Um, so when looking at how we organise, value and finance land for housing, I think we need to look widely at the full economic and social impacts. Um, in a way, land, I suppose, our most fundamental basic resource um, that we all need and use must be seen as part of the circular economy. Um, we use, and importantly should reuse, land um, to meet our changing needs. Now, picking up just some of the, the theme about the, the sites and the particular vacant and derelict sites, last year we published guidance on assessing the full economic benefits of reusing land, um, really to inform the business case and appraisal of costs and benefits of redevelopment. Now, while that was focused on reusing vacant and derelict sites, it strikes me that really the same considerations apply and can be used to assess costs and benefits much more widely um, and help deliver upon the kind of policy ambitions that we're talking about today, um, 20 minute neighbourhoods uh, and more. Guidance, for example, looks at how to build in consideration of well-being, economic and fiscal costs and benefits, um, really aiming to capture some of the wider social and community costs and benefits, um, as well as the wider impacts on public revenue. 
So I think in part there's a job to do in being able to assess and demonstrate that wider value. Um, but of course, there's also the fundamental job of aligning the bits of our system to actually create this value in the first place. Um, and that's the bit I want to say um, a bit more about just now. At the Land Commission, of course, our focus is on the land element of the system. How does our land system and the way we bring forward land for development help or hinder delivery of high quality places um, and the ambitions of 20 minute neighbourhoods? I want to say a bit about our recent work looking at housing land markets um, and some of the proposals for reform that we've made um, in the context of today's discussions. So in August, we published some proposals for reforms to the way land is brought forward for development. Um, and this drew on several specific pieces of work, um, including a report on land for rural housing. And um, that report um, by Savills, which some of you may have read at the time, emphasised that greater facilitation and support, particularly of the kind delivered by Communities Housing Trust, is absolutely key to scaling up delivery. Um, it also recognised that the Rural Housing Fund and Scottish Land Fund are game changers in enabling new rural development. Um, and it proposed that some form of land agency would help partners deliver a pipeline of developable sites. And I think in looking at examples, the research looked at the experience of the Applecross community, um, which Ronnie mentioned briefly. Um, particularly their experience in developing a land use plan uh, it really is an example of how a place plan can be developed to meet a community's needs. Uh, and I think it's interesting just to reflect on some of the key factors that it found behind that approach being taken in Applecross, um, which really included in-depth community engagement uh, at, a, at a really early stage, um, crucially an enabling body, in this case the Communities Housing Trust, to support that process, um, the development of a land use plan that met wider community needs, um, and also, crucially, local authority involvement and support. Um, the approach worked, I think, very much as local place plans could. So I think for us, Applecross is a really good example of the kind of approach needed. Uh, not only can it deliver local place planning, um, it's a basis for a much wider land use planning rooted in places that's going to be needed in the transition to a net zero economy. Uh, and we should certainly be looking for ways to embed that as a normal approach. Turning more widely, um, our recent review of land for housing at a Scotland level found that the current model, which nationally, I suppose, is dominated by a speculative approach to land acquisition and development, simply doesn't really work well enough in creating the kind of places that we need, and um, particularly for both rural and regeneration areas. Now, that, I suppose, is no surprise here. Um, Communities Housing Trust and its previous form has, of course, long stepped into that gap um, and proven the success of a different model. Um, our recommendations coming from that review really focus on making a fundamental shift to a more public interest led approach to the pipeline of development land for housing. Um, and at its heart, it's about a much more proactive role, a very proactive role for the public sector playing its part. Uh, crucially, not instead of the private sector or indeed community sectors, but alongside them. Um, so we've proposed overall that the public sector should take more leadership on creating a long term land supply, particularly within public or community control. Um, and of course, in doing so, it should take its share in both the risks and rewards of that process. Um, in the big picture, we think that would enable householders to focus more on the core business of building houses and less on land speculation, and over the long term, help stabilise prices. Um, now that's obviously a fairly fundamental shift in culture at the Scotland level, um, and so we proposed a series of steps that would help government move steadily towards that. One of those early steps that we proposed um, is, is really the opportunity to develop what we've called place pioneers. And, and the fundamental um, kind of central idea to this is, is establishing a recyclable land fund. Uh, government to establish a, a land fund that could be recycled from site to site, backed up with the collaboration to bring the required expertise together, and um, particularly to focus on rural and regeneration areas and scale up existing models, um, including community-led housing. We've also proposed uh, in that report a public land agency, um, a role really to provide focused skills and support in creating a long-term land supply, um, significantly within public or community control. And when we looked at other countries in Northern Europe as part of this work, we can see this role is played really as a matter of course by municipal authorities. And although we don't have the same local government structures in Scotland, we can, I think, learn from this and build the same kind of approach within our public sector. Um, our two nearest neighbours, England and Ireland, both have public land agencies uh, created really to enable the public sector to act as a, a land promoter and shape markets in the public interest. And I think in making this kind of approach work here, an agency, however structured, um, would need to work locally, working through local authorities, communities um, and other partners in providing a pipeline of development land. 
And I think here there are particular opportunities to think through how that can support a long-term land supply um, within community control. So really turning back to, I suppose, the core focus of your discussions today, um, these housing proposals, the reforms we proposed um, in the summer are driven by the same focus as other land reforms um, at its core, um, ensuring that we're using our land productively um, in a way that's accountable and creates wide public benefit. Um, it's really about aligning things to create the kind of social and economic value that we've been talking about. Um, in this case, creating not just housing, but, but places. And I think really there's very evident value created in the examples we've heard about just now. Um, social and economic value that goes well beyond the construction of houses. Um, our job collectively, I think, is to, uh, to ensure not just that we can measure and demonstrate this, but actually that we're active in aligning all parts of the system to create it. So I think finally, just to, to finish in that spirit, I want to end by making some connections to wider context at the moment. Um, in this parliament, there are commitments, obviously, to a land reform bill um, addressing concentrated land ownership, um, to a community wealth building bill. Um, there's commitments to review of CPO powers, review of community asset transfer, to doubling of the land fund, uh, amongst many other relevant things. Uh, we're also working on advice to government on ways to complement the Scottish Land Fund with wider sources of finance um, to further support community ownership of land and property, um, as well as finalising advice on potential tax reforms. So my point really is that there are many things in play here and um, many opportunities. So I think making the connections and um, joining the dots as we've started to do in this discussion in the value created through community-led housing and the places it delivers, I think really has never been more relevant. So thanks for the opportunity just to share some thoughts with you on that and very much look forward to, uh, to picking up your thoughts and any questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Hamish. That was very good. Um, it, it is um, pleasing to see that there are some parts of, of um, the, or some agencies that actually work together and coordinate um, maybe whether it's officially or unofficially, but they're actually working almost with the same um, palette and their paintbrushes. And um, so, yeah, that's very good. Thank you very much. And no doubt there'll be lots of questions. Um, so that, can I open the questions now, please? Would there anybody like to... Mm -hmm. Any questions for any of our people? Sarah, yeah. you so we've help? had yeah, we've had a question um for Steph, which I'll ask in a second. But if anybody I'm I'm aware that because we're over time, we've got very limited, we've got about five minutes of questions. So if people would like to type the questions into the chat, we're so many people, it's just easier to if you just type it into the chat if that's okay. And any any questions that we don't get to, I'll I'll ask our speakers to respond um and hopefully we'll put out a blog if if necessary. But yeah, so to start with Connor's question, um, which is particularly directed for Steph, but I'm sure if, the, if other speakers want to come in on it. So Connor asks, do you think there is a cultural hurdle to overcome when implementing the 20 minute neighborhood? Traditionally in the UK, the public have tended to favor low density monofunctional suburbs to higher density mixed use space that we see in the cities of Europe. So I'm wondering if there is work needed to change the mindset of the public to accept higher density living. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think it's not only the mindset of the public, it's the mindset of the planners, um, because we have a tendency to, to uh, planners have a tendency, uh, it's a very sweeping statement, obviously, but um, to accept and agree to things that look the same as the current environment looks, right? So it's particularly in suburbs, you know, oh, well, that's what the houses look like, so we'll build more of them rather than saying, actually, we need diverse typologies that serve a different function. We need to, you know, my, my standard bugbear is why are we still building houses that look like the houses we built 50 years ago? Why, why is that? You know, why, why have we not progressed in terms of the, the structure and the, the setup and um, of how we build houses? And others in the world have, and and I think you know that's the responsibility of all of us, um, from a public sector, from a from a personal perspective. That's about us demanding something different, and accepting something different. But um, from a, a a policy and a developer's perspective, it's about offering something different. And I think what we're not getting is anything different being offered to people. So it's a real challenge um, in that sense. So yeah, I mean. I think 
the people buying things that are look different is probably the least of our worries. We're just not getting that different um, environment, that that vertical zoning, that that actually people living above spaces that are active, you know, and and multi generational living. I think is the other element to this that we, we don't see much of. We see pretty mono kind of you know again in communities being built for families you know and the idea that they have two cars and they're they're all set up for families as opposed to actually some of them might just be small apartments you know they they might be single people our demographics are changing so dramatically um, and we're not keeping up with any of that i think from um from a housing perspective sorry i rabbited on <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. Thanks so much, Steph. I was just wondering if um if Ronnie or Hamish might want to come in on that. And I know I also know we've we've um audience members um who who may want to comment on that as well. So you're very welcome to unmute and, and comment if if you wish to. No, no, I'll just um I'll just add briefly on that. I think part part of that culture difference is down, of course, the way land comes forward and the way the, the, the planning process works. Um, and, and some of the work we did looking at Germany and the Netherlands, for example, it's really clear that it's the, it's the leadership within the public authorities there and the master planning processes that creates that kind of value in those sites. So again, I think part of this is about how do we create that kind of publicly led master planning to, to create um, the, the, the extra, the, the placemaking qualities um, that we're looking at there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's all good points that's been raised there. I mean, the for us this this has been a long standing question and it, and it's about uh, the conflict if you like between policy because we do have an environmental crisis just now and uh, you know potentially elements of the planning policy are not aligned with efficient uh, land use. Uh, like I said earlier in the presentation, the need to use existing sites and make the most of derelict buildings is is increasingly required because greenfield sites can't keep on being used in an inefficient manner like we're doing at the moment so we have to get much better at that grand thank you ronnie um does anybody else have any questions nothing has appeared in the chat so i'm fairly tempted actually to hand back to sheena and then we shall remain on time and the board members can continue their board meeting <laughs> um yeah I, thank you very much, Sarah. That's very helpful. Um, yes, I mean, personally, I think that um, the planning rules and regulations really need to be rewritten um, to allow for more scope and more um, imagination um, and for the different communities and their needs. Uh, it, sometimes I think it's just too much in tablets of stone. However, Yes, I think because we're running a bit shorter time, well, we're just about right for the um, board meeting. Can I thank you all for coming, all of those of you who've spoken, um, very interesting discussions, and um, I'm sure many of us will be picking up in much of what's been said. Um, and thank all of you who've been listening, who aren't actually part of the Communities Housing Trust. And if I will now close the AGM and allow those to go who wish to go, and we will start the board meeting in, we'll have, can we have three minutes, Sarah, for just for those who might want a comfort break? Of course we may. I'm not going to stop people having a well, comfort no, break. Well, at the time, that's what I mean. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we should definitely have a comfort break. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely to Thank talk. you all. Bye Thank now. you, Stephanie Good. and Jane and Hamish. Yeah, huge thanks for all the speakers. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, no thanks problem. so much, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Thanks. Bye.